Hello dear viewers, Edge has invited me to be in this year's Paleo Rewind. So let me tell you about the most interesting papers published this February. Also Edge said make the video as you as possible, so... But he runs into another predator that is waiting for him. The claws of the Therizinosaurus pierce the youngster's body. It's a total fabrication. <laughs> Not this time, it never happened. This one was invented by a writer. It's an urban legend that never happened. Functional space analyses reveal the function and evolution of the most bizarre theropod manual unguals. Chin et al. did a morphological analysis of the claws of Alvarezsaurs and Ferrisinosaurs to see how well they would handle the stress of the following physical actions. Piercing, scratch, digging and hook and pulling. For reference, they analyzed the claws of Guan Long and Allosaurus to represent more typical theropods and compared the results to the claws of mammals with well understood ecology, named namely a puma, a pangolin, a tamandua and a ground sloth. Unsurprisingly, the typical theropod claws are rather unspecialized like those of the puma and perform well at all three functions, although they are worse at digging than the other actions. The most basal alvarez source like Haplochiris had grasping hands that were bad at digging, but once you get to more derived alvarez source with their stubby one-clawed arms, the digging capabilities get better. Mononychus in particular performs most similar to the pangolin, another indicator that like this mammal, Mononychus would have been a specialized insectivore, breaking open termite mounds. Ferrisinosaurs turned out to be bad at scratch digging, with early Ferrisinosaurs like Alxasaurus being good at piercing and pulling, so they probably grasped tree branches, similar to how it is assumed for ground sloths. Well, that whole paper just confirmed things we already expected, what's the big deal? Oh, this is the performance of Ferrisinosaurus itself, and it turns out the long claws of Ferrisinosaurus suck at everything. Digging, pulling, piercing. All result in high stress levels that the claws wouldn't be able to bear. So unfortunately, Ferrisinosaurus probably didn't slap giant theropods with its claws. It probably couldn't even pull in tree branches for feeding like its earlier relatives did. Not that it needed that at its size and neck length. Even when you account for how much larger Ferrisinosaurus is than other Ferrisinosaurus, its claws are disproportionately large. You hate to hear it, but those oversized claws were most likely used just for visual display. On the plus side, imagine how cool their mating dances must have looked like. Largest known fossil penguin provides insight into the early evolution of Phenisciform body size and flipper anatomy. Xepka et al. described giant New Zealand penguins from the late Paleocene Meraki formation, which was deposited 55 to 59 million years ago, only 10 million years or even less after the KPG extinction event. One of these is the new species Kumimanu 40 say. With how fragmentary fossil penguins are, it is difficult to estimate how tall they would have been, so a more reliable size estimate is measuring their arm or leg bones and use them as proxy to calculate their body mass. Based on its humerus, Kumimanu 40 say is estimated to have weighed 159 kilograms, making it the largest penguin to have ever lived. Another new species from the same formation is Petradiptus stonehousei, and even that one was still larger than a modern emperor penguin. There are already many other species of giant penguins from the Paleocene and Eocene, but Kumimanu 40 say is one of the earliest and most basal ones, and yet also the largest, showing how quickly birds filled the empty niches left behind by marine reptiles after their extinction. A Mesozoic fossil Lagerstätte from 250.8 million years ago shows a modern type marine ecosystem. The Permian-Triassic boundary is marked by the most severe mass extinction in the history of Earth. Over 90% of species died out, more than at the end of the Cretaceous. Paleontologists used to believe that the extinction was so devastating that it took many millions of years for marine ecosystems to recover step by step, with the early Triassic only providing for primary producers and primary consumers, with secondary consumers like crustaceans and ammonoids only appearing at the beginning of the Middle Triassic and tertiary consumers like fish slightly later in the Middle Triassic. But now, Dai et al. have described a fossil assemblage from the Dai formation near Guiyang in South China. It is the oldest known Mesozoic Lagerstätte at 250.8 million years, just 1 million years after the Permian extinction event, and it already has a complex ecosystem with several different bony fish, for example Silakenti 
forms. Maybe this assemblage represents a refuge where marine life was sheltered from the effects of the Permian extinction event, or maybe we underestimated how quickly life could recover from even the most devastating extinction event in the history of Earth, and that our sparse fossil record of the early Triassic is just a result of preservational bias. Triassic nursery? Evidence of gregarious behavior in juvenile Pseudosuchian archosaurs as inferred by humoral histology of Aetosaurus ferratus, Norian, southern Germany. Aetosaurs were herbivorous Triassic crocodile relatives who basically were ankylosaurs before ankylosaurs were even a thing. The most famous member of the group is the large spiky Desmatosuchus from North America, but the name giver of the group, Aetosaurus, is a small featureless animal from Germany, only up to 1.5 meters long. The best Aetosaurus material is an accumulation of 24 individuals between 20 and 82 cm long from the Lower Stubensandstein near Stuttgart. Teschner et al. have sectioned two humeri from this assemblage, one of the smallest and one of the largest, to study their histology. Bone histology gives information about the growth of an animal and therefore its age, and these bones were highly vascularized and show no bone resorption or annual growth marks, indicating that these were juveniles that were not even one year old. With even the largest specimen being so young, it becomes more likely that the genus Aetosaurus is currently only represented by juveniles. There is a larger Aetosaur from the Stubensandstein, Paratypophorax, that may turn out to be the adult form of Aetosaurus. Another interesting fact about the assemblage is that it doesn't show any evidence of post-mortem transport, which means that all these juveniles lived and died together. Maybe they even originated from the same clutch. <laughs> A giant phytosaur, Diapsida archosauria, from the Upper Triassic of India with new insights on phytosaur migration, endemism and extinction. Phytosaurs were carnivorous Triassic crocodile relatives who basically were crocodiles before crocodiles were even a thing. Hey, wait a second. Data and Ray describe a new phytosaur species based on at least 21 specimens from a bone bed in the Upper Triassic Tiki Formation in India. The largest complete mandible is 1.1 meters long, with the entire animal estimated to be over 8 meters long, making it one of the largest known phytosaurs. Hence its name, Colossosuchus techniensis. Phylogenetic analysis nests it within Mistriosuchine, where it forms a clade with two other Indian phytosaurs that have not been described yet. This is the earliest case of of phytosaurs endemic to Gondwana, despite the fact that phytosaurs as a whole are distributed across the entire globe. Phytosaurs probably dispersed during the Carnian through inland waterways and along the Tethian coast, with many taxa going extinct in the early Norian as the climate became drier. <laughs> An ankylosaur larynx provides insights for bird-like vocalization in non-avian dinosaurs. Unlike humans and other mammals, reptiles have no vocal cords and can only produce sounds using their larynx made of cartilage, which is for example what crocodiles do. Modern birds have evolved a separate organ, the syrinx, to produce sound, and their larynx has become enlarged, ossified and kinetic, allowing them to modify the sounds produced by the syrinx. If you've ever wondered why so many paleontologists are ruining your childhood by by saying that T-Rex would have been incapable of roaring, this is why. Non-avian dinosaurs do not have this specialized larynx and would thus have been incapable of producing complex vocal sounds. Or at least that's what we used to think until Yoshida et al. described the larynx in a specimen of the Mongolian ankylosaur Pinacosaurus. It's the best preserved larynx in a non-avian dinosaur because it too is ossified. The larynx of Pinacosaurus is much more similar to modern birds than to other reptiles. The cricoid is large and wide, and the paired erytenoids are long and connected with a firm joint. These are the same adaptations that modern birds use to modify the sounds produced by the syrinx, which means that ankylosaurs might have also been capable of producing complex vocal sounds. It remains to be seen whether ankylosaurs evolved this bird-like voice box independently, or whether it was a far more widespread feature within non-avian dinosaurs that is simply usually not preserved or overlooked during preparation because of how delicate these tiny throat bones are. Modified skulls but conservative brains? The paleoneurology and endocranial anatomy of baryonic kind dinosaurs, Theropoda spinosauridae. 
With their long slender snouts and conical teeth, Spinosaurids clearly were to some degree specialized for catching aquatic prey and probably lived a semi-aquatic lifestyle. So you would expect their brains to also reflect adaptations for this lifestyle. That is what Barker et al. set out to do by CT scanning the brain cases of two baryonic kind Spinosaurids from early Cretaceous Britain, Baryonyx and Ceratosuchops. And the special thing about these baryonic kinds brains is how non-special they are. The the team compared the brain cases to the endocasts of other, more typical theropods and surprisingly found barely any differences. The inner ear is similar to abelisaurs and allosauroids and would have allowed these theropods to hear low pitch frequencies. And the olfaction is similar to ceratosaurs, allosauroids and basal tyrannosauroids. A different study had previously looked at the brain case of spinosaurine spinosaurids like Irritator and found them to have high pitch hearing and reduced olfactory bulbs, which the authors had considered indicators for an aquatic lifestyle. Now the baryonic kind brain cases diminish the importance of these features. If the brain of a baryonyx is so similar to that of an allosaurus or ceratosaurus, it seems like any of these theropods had the theoretical pre-adaptations to evolve into a semi-aquatic niche. With the important factor not necessarily being to change the anatomy of the brain, but just to modify the snout and dentition. Giant Jurassic dragon lacewing larvae with lacustrine paleoecology represent the oldest fossil record of larval neuropterans. Do et al. describe a neuropteran larva from the Daohugo beds, a middle Jurassic conservat lagerstätte of China. Paleoneurotus bai is the earliest but also largest neuropteran larva fossil known, with a length of 4.3 cm. Its elongated worm-like body, slender and elongated cervix and straight jaws with curved tips most closely resemble larvae of the modern neuropterans in the family Nephrotidae. These modern larvae are way smaller and live at the bottom of fast-flowing mountain streams, while Paleoneurotus was found in a shallow lake environment. It is possible that this spacious environment with more abundant food allowed this prehistoric neuropteran larva to grow so large. Like its modern relatives, its long cervix and long jaws allowed it to catch struggling prey without risking damage to its delicate abdomen. first monotreme from the late Cretaceous of South America. Modern and fossil monotremes are only known from Australasia, with the exception of a single fossil from Paleocene South America named Monotrematum. Now Kimento et al. described Patagorhynchus pasquali from the early Maastrichtian Corillo formation in southern Patagonia. While it is only a jaw fragment with a single molar, it definitely belongs to a monotreme, showing that monotremes were already spread across Gondwana in the Cretaceous. So far, no monotreme Monotremes are known from northern Patagonia, but not just the mammals, but also dinosaurs differ in the north and south. Abelisaurids and saltasaurines are found in northern and central Patagonia, while Megaraptorans and Colossosaurians are found in southern Patagonia. These different faunas probably reflect different environments, with a dry and warm climate in the north and a humid and cold climate in the south. In fact, other authors have even argued that some anatomical characteristics of monotremes, like their low metabolism and electroreception, are results of evolving within a polar environment. A high-latitude Gondwanan species of the late Devonian Tristichopterid Hyneria, Osteictes sarcopterygii. Tristichopteridae is a clade of Devonian sarcopterygians, which inhabited both the northern old red continent Euramerica and the huge southern continent Gondwana. Their most famous representative is the giant late Devonian Hyneria, named after Hynea in Pennsylvania, which used to be the only place in the world it was known from. Now Guess and Alberg describe a new species based on skull bones from the Waterloo Farm Lagerstätte in South Africa. Hyneria utlicinje is the largest bony fish from the site, with the holotype estimated to be 1.8 meters long and one isolated bone belonging to an individual 2.7 meters long. Many twisty shopterids have been found in Australia, so the clade that Hyneria belonged to was previously hypothesized to have originated in Australia and then migrated to Euramerica. Now it seems that this was just the result of collection bias and twisty shopterids were so 
widely distributed throughout Gondwana that no precise locality can be pinned down as a point of origin. During the Devonian, this South African Lagerstätte was located near the Poles, making Haneria Utlitzinje the first known polar twisty shop to it. But it's becoming increasingly obvious. I can deny it no longer! I am small. A Devonian fishtail, a new method of body length estimation suggests much smaller sizes for Dunkleosteus terrelli, Placodermi, Aphrodira. Ah yes, Dunkleosteus, the armored monster fish that famously outsized everything else in the Devonian. Or did it? You see, being an Aphrodite Placoderm, Dunkleosteus had an ossified skull and thorax armor, but the rest of its skeleton was made from cartilage and thus never fossilized. All those spectacular claims of 8, 9 or even 10 meters in length never had any real basis. Sometimes smaller Aphrodite relatives known from complete fossils like Cocosteus are cited as the basis, but with their different proportions you would realistically get different size estimates for Dunkleosteus depending on which specific bone you use for reference. So, Russell Engelmann set out to find a proxy that would accurately estimate a fish's body size regardless of phylogeny, that would be consistent in extant fish whether shark or bony fish and would also work for aphrodias known from complete body fossils, and that would also be applicable to a fossil like Dunkleosteus that is only known from its head and thorax armor. The proxy he decided on was the length from the orbit to the opercular, as this is dictated by the fish's brain orbit and gill chamber. These organs constrain body size because the gills cannot be too small to replenish the body with enough oxygen, but also not too large to require more energy than they would produce. Plus they have to be optimized for allowing the body to retain a hydrodynamic shape. Unless you are dealing with a fish that has a very extreme body shape, this proxy correlates pretty well. The simple rule is that a fish with a long shallow head will have a long shallow body, and a fish with a short deep head will have a short deep body. And Dunkleosteus has a deep head with deep armor. The most famous Dunkleosteus specimen the skull and thorax armor at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History measures 1.3 meters from the tip of the snout to the tip of the ventral shield and represents a typical adult size Dunkleosteus. And in Engelmann's analysis, its length is only 3.4 meters. But wait, you say, there are fragments of larger Dunkleosteus specimens, aren't there? Well, the largest known specimen is a lower jawbone 25% larger than the one of the Cleveland specimen, which would belong to a Dunkleosteus that was 4.1 meters long at best. It sounds shockingly short, but Engelmann also brings up another feature in Aphrodias, namely that the pelvic girl is located just behind the end of the ventral armor. Like it or not, based on his calculations, a Dunkleosteus based on the fossils we have simply couldn't have been anywhere near as long as so many books and documentaries used to claim. But here's the thing all you salty Dunkleosteus fans don't understand. No matter how much Dunkleosteus is downsized, its skull stays the same. Engelmann even states directly in the paper, based on mouth size, a 3.5 meter Aphrodite can effectively fill the same ecological role as a 5.5 meter shark. Also, this shortened body shape just means that you should no longer see Dunkleosteus as an armored shark, but instead as an armored tuna. In other words, a cannonball with jaws. In other words, a freaking real life bullet bill. This paper got such a huge reaction that Engelmann wrote a follow up article in November to re explain the science behind this, and his title was What Shrunk the Dunk? explaining the science behind a major update to the appearance of a prehistoric icon. Think about that. So many people were upset at Dunkleosteus getting downsized that the author had to make the scientific equivalent of a twit longer response and reassure people that his estimations are as reasonable as possible. If that doesn't make this paper the funniest thing to happen to paleontology in 2023, I don't know. 